What really want, what fascinated you about the whole concept of marshlands? Why did you want to write it? The, the thing that was interesting about it was uh, when ITV approached me with this uh, structure that, that they had in mind where it was a uh, three a three-tiered story with a linking supernatural element. Um, it, the, the thing that kind of grabbed me about it was, that was the fact that I, I hadn't seen anything work like that before and also it was such a big canvas. So it was about, you know, the question I had was, uh, have I got something I want to write about that, that is appropriate enough for, for, for that, such a big canvas where, you'd, where there was something thematically that you felt that, that wasn't just about telling one story, but it was about telling multiple stories of different aspects of the same theme. And, uh, and at that point in time, the thing that was kind of preoccupying me was about parenthood, because I'd just had a baby, and, uh, and about the, the weird mental state that that pushes you into, and, and wandering about at three in the morning thinking, this, this must be what it feels like to go mad. Right, where your sense of reality is completely altered and, and you start seeing things like the corner of your eye that you know aren't there but you're seeing them. So it's, it was that kind of, a, that kind of being on a, a marginal state and a sort of feeling like you're on the edge of reality in a slightly sort of altered state that, a, that, that was fascinating me at the time and of course as soon as you have a, uh, well what happened to me was I had, had the first baby, you start to project. There's a scene in, in, in the show where, where the new father talks about how the baby for him is like a little time machine because suddenly he's seeing the baby as a school kid and then as a student and then as a woman and then as an, a, you know, an adult and he's, his whole life just suddenly zooms to, towards his own death. And, uh, and that kind of, that's what happened to me and you suddenly start to anticipate that, you know, that, that the worst thing that could happen to you shifts because it's not about you anymore. The worst thing that could happen to you is if something happened to them and so suddenly your fears amplify in, in a whole different arena. So that, that massive shift was, was what was preoccupying me at the time and I thought that that was something that was rich enough to sustain itself over three different kinds of story but all connected because of that, that one thematic element and also that, that sense of an altered state uh, lent itself to the notion of a supernatural element about something that, that may or may not be there, that might be real, might not be real, might be of this world or somewhere else. And you know, Shelley Conn, she's her character's pregnant in this and as a pregnant woman, your emotions are all over the place. That was that was the that was the easiest thing to write because that was the experience that I'd that I'd just gone through with my partner and that, that whole sense of uh, of of the nervousness of the of the, of the soon to be father and the kind of the nervousness and the fear. So that sense about wanting to do things right and wanting to be supportive, but at the same time dealing with all sorts of panic things that are going on inside. You not know whether it's appropriate to share that or not share that, and then watching her deal with a sense of a uh, of her body changing and a loss of control. So there's that sense of kind of a loss of control of your own body and even though it's a joyous experience there's that slight oddness if you're someone who's always used to being in charge of things and, and having control of things and suddenly you're, you're taking out your work environment and put into a domestic environment and, and uh, all sorts of attitudes change around you and I, I think uh, it's a, I think it's, it's a common thing that that's very disorientating if you especially if you're someone who's quite powerful and in charge of your life and, and uh, Shelley plays a character who's uh, a lawyer who's, who's just on top of everything and the pregnancy is part of a long-term plan, and then suddenly, you know, things can't be planned for her at a certain point, and she has to just give in to the, to the, you know, to the the vicissitudes of, of things that might happen, and that's quite difficult for her. Interesting, the supernatural element. Do you believe in ghosts, though? I believe in ghost stories. Uh, they're they're a they're some of my favourite kinds of storytelling, and I think that the that where they work best is where where you don't need to uh, believe or not believe in the supernatural, believe it because they work as a kind of as a metaphor, so it's actually what what makes them frightening and scary is because they tap into something at the back of your head, some some fear that, that is, is rooted in reality, and the ghost is just an expression of that. So, so from my point of view, it, a, whether there is an afterlife or not, or whether there's spooks floating about, it, it, it does it doesn't trouble me to think about that. But what I absolutely believe in is ghost stories. And the grief, grief is a tremendous part of it, especially in the 1960s with that family, the loss of a child and it's, you know, the way Jodie particularly acts that is very heartfelt. Yeah, it was, um, it, it was always one of the story strands that I wanted to explore. I've written about grief before and, uh, but, but, what, but my thought process about grief had changed since becoming a father because, because you know, they just, you start to kind of, you have to open a door on what your what your worst fears would be, and you have to you know walk into that room. You suddenly have access to a, a, a depth of emotion that you hadn't previously had before, and uh, putting that in that sexy storyline was interesting because it, uh, when I'd written about grief before, it was in a contemporary setting where where you've got a, a, a vocabulary and a set of expectations about how things will be discussed that, that allow it to be expressed. And, and what was what was painful for Jodie's character and really interesting for me as a writer was to to, to compress that 
grief experience in that claustrophobic sixties environment where she's struggling to express it in an environment where everyone else is repressing it and actually and are telling her that actually what you need to do is, is, is keep that stiff upper lip and just keep quiet and just get on with it. And it's a, it, it, it was to kind of contrast that notion that, that I think that, that now we have sort of a, an accepted understanding about how people will work through grief and, and you know, talk about it and, and talk their way through it. And to understand actually that that wasn't always the case, that, that for, a, for a lot of people and for previous generations, it was a case of actually you deal with it and whatever's going on, you keep it to yourself. And, uh, and we've got Jodie as a, a, rep, a sort of, a, a someone who's of the late 60s living in a family who's more or less of the 50s and there's that kind of clash of, of how they express themselves. So it was a really interesting, um, difficult for that character, but a really interesting situation to have that grief story played out, I think. What's it like for you to see these characters, you know, your characters, with life breathed into them by this fantastic <laughs> care? It's, it's always, it's always, it's always nerve-wracking because uh, there's a point where as the scriptwriter you, you've, you've lived with these characters in your head for months and years. And then you know that, that what you need to happen at the end of that process is for actors to come in and then take these characters and make them their own. And there's part of you that's, that's really happy and joyful about that. There's a part of you that's very frightened of that because sometimes they come in and make them their own and they take them so far away from what you intended that it becomes, becomes fraught. But in this case, actually, the, 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 the cast were so brilliant that actually the, the, they came in, they took it and they claimed those characters and then did, did uh, create what I'd seen in my head. It was the first, it was almost the first experience I'd had of that, about wandering about on set, watching them perform, thinking this is very close to what I had in my head. So from that point of view, it was, a, it was really satisfying and a huge relief because actually that's not always the case. Now you've written for Doctor Who. Yeah. So you wrote The Doctor's Daughter and you also wrote um, Mark Gattis's um, Yeah, The episode, Lazarus Experiment, yeah. The Lazarus Experiment. How did writing for Doctor Who help you in, in putting Marshlands together? The thing that they, they drummed into me in Doctor Who and uh, that I learned a lot from, uh, from Russell T Davis who was running Doctor Who at that time was about storytelling. So uh, if there's an influence in, in, uh, in Marchlands, it's because the Marchlands story is so complicated uh, that we had to make sure that there wasn't anything extraneous in it. That actually that everything that was in there is in there for a reason and that, I, that even though it's complicated that the way through it for the viewer is clear if you just stay with it and that Doctor Who were, were fantastic in that because they're, they're, they've got quite complex stories and they're really time limited to the length of the episodes so what they drum into is to make sure that everything that's in there earns its place and that you do things in the most elegant and efficient way possible and that the pace of it kind of carries on so so aside from writing action adventure sequences with giant monsters, which is also an education, it, the, the key thing that, that, that I learned on that show was about to make sure that the storytelling is, is lean and efficient and, and, and there's no spare fat on that there. And that's what I brought into Marshlands, I think. It's interesting, you've got you know, Alex and Anne who are both in Doctor Who working on this <laughs> as well. <laughs> no, it was good. But you know, Doctor Who is such a kind of, a, it's such a, a, a touchstone now in the industry that actually there's always kind of alumni that crop up in different things, whether it's on the crew or in the writing crew or, or in the cast, that there's always people that have kind of done their time in Doctor Who and again sprung off to do other things. Are you proud of Marchlands when you see it? Um, I'm, it, it's, it I'm immensely proud of it because actually a, it's, it is the closest, it's the closest thing that I've done on TV to, a, to how I'd imagined it when I was writing it because TV is a, a negotiation when you go through it from script to, to screen. And there are so many people involved and so many different inputs, and uh, and this is one of those rare uh, occasions I think where, actually where, where all those inputs have kind of have, have, have taken it in a direction that that, that that has been surprising and, and delighting for me because it's kind of it, it's become the show that I'd imagined it, it it would be in my head at the start, and that's not always the case. So sometimes you have to adjust your expectations about certain things, but with Marchlands, that every time you get into the the dub to watch what happens when the music goes on or you see how they cut together the three stories actually you think oh it's working the way, the way I'd thought it might work it's working